McNamara is the new name of our federal electorate. It, part of it used to be called Melbourne Court, Ports, but it's now extended. You can find where you live there, probably. Um, and climate change is a hot topic in this electorate. As you know, a high proportion of the electorate is built on low-lying, often reclaimed land and hence vulnerable to sea level rises. 4,274 constituents have written that their opposition to the Adani mine will influence their vote at this election. The Australian Conservation Foundation, ACF, has 6,232 McNamara citizens in its supporter base. And all of you are here tonight to hear what the candidates have to say. So, let's get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Peter Mayers, who's our moderator for the evening. Peter is the lead moderator with the Kranlana Centre for Ethical Leadership. He is also a contributing editor at Inside Story magazine and an adjunct fellow at Swinburne University's Centre for Urban Transitions. He was an ABC broadcaster for 25 years and the author of three books. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Pam, and uh, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me to chair this important forum. It's fabulous to see so many people turning out to give serious thought to our democratic choices around climate change and energy at the forthcoming federal election. So I want to start with a quick straw poll. Please raise your hand if climate change will be a significant factor in determining how you vote at the election. Hmm, it's a lot, of, a lot of hands up. Uh, I won't be voting in McNamara. I'm a, a former St Kilda resident, but I moved out of the electorate after the last federal poll, so I'm not backing any particular candidate in this race. But you did see I raised my own hand, so I'm not going to pretend that I don't have views on climate change. And in the interest of transparency, let me declare a couple of things. During the past eight months, I've twice spoken at events in the city of Port Phillip organised by the Greens. And on both occasions, I would say I was invited to speak uh, about housing policy in particular on the basis of my recently released book, and this is the plug, No Place Like Home, Repairing Australia's Housing Crisis. And I'll add that if either the Labor or Liberal Party in, uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the electorate would like me to come and speak about housing to them, I'd be more than happy to do so. So having made that declaration, let me also stress that I volunteered my services tonight uh, and I do so because I believe passionately that reasoned and civil public debate is a cornerstone of a flourishing democracy, and I commend the organisers for making this event possible. I'm here in a professional capacity and as someone with many years' experience facilitating public conversations, and so I'm acutely aware of the responsibility attached to the role, and I'll do my very best to ensure that all three candidates get a fair hearing and roughly equal time, and that we get a fair spread of questions from the floor and from the online submissions that have been made in advance. So we're going to kick off this evening with three perspectives on climate change from people who've been deeply engaged in the issue. And I'll interview, in, introduce them to you in turn. They'll speak for five or seven minutes. So our first speaker is Simon Holmes Accord. He's a senior advisor to the Climate and Energy College at the University of Melbourne. He sits on the board of the Smart Energy Council. He was the founding chair of Hepburn Wind, the country's first community-owned wind farm, and, a founder, and the founder of Embark Australia, a not-for-profit consultancy that helps communities to share in the benefits of local Renewable Energy. Please welcome Simon Holmes to court. Thank you very much, Peter, for that introduction, and thank you very much all for coming out, giving you a Wednesday night uh, to show your uh, show, show your uh, the importance of this issue to so many people in the seat of McNamara. Up on the screen, uh, this this uh, beautiful graphic by Ed Hawkins is actually a terrifying terrifying picture, an awful and I think disturbing picture. On the left hand side we have a stripe representing the temperature in 1910 in Australia and on the right hand side 2017 
the cooler the colour, the cooler the temperature, the warmer the colour, the warmer the temperature. Undeniable, the, the far right is a dark, dark red for the record. Uh, summer we just had two degrees in Australia above uh, the long term, uh, but, but, but above our summer, mac, um, summer average, uh, which uh, makes it the hottest summer on record in Australia. Often I'm asked why should Australia, uh, why, why should Australia care about uh, responding to this challenge? We only represent 1.3% of global emissions. We only represent 0.3% of global population. So that means the average one of us here uh, um, emits four times as much as the average citizen on this planet. Uh, so uh, perhaps that should be enough to, to um, make, make some of us consider that we have a moral responsibility, especially as one of the wealthiest nations, uh, to respond here. Now, we may not be the biggest emitter, but we're not far from the top of the list. And in fact, I've, I've got, of the six countries on the, on the, to the left of this chart, um, we fall in the under 2% club on the right-hand side, but we are right up there near the top. And in the 2% the, the club, if this button works, represent this grey line here, the fastest growing line, while China, it's a little bit up on last year, but the, the rest of the world is actually the fastest growing category. And as I went back here, the rest of the world is a larger category than China, almost as big as China and the US together. So we are significant, we play a significant role in that rest of the world category. We came together as, as, uh, as nations, 195 nations signed on to the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, this chart shows how we're going. We're currently one degree above the pre-industrial average temperatures. Uh, the current commitments to the, to the um, Paris Agreement have us, uh, the pledges at three degrees, the policies are running behind the pledges at a 3.3 degree warming world. Now, Three degrees might, some people might think in Melbourne, three degrees would be kind of nice sometimes in winter to have an extra bit of warmth. But three degrees, we've, we've just had uh, a summer, as you know, of uh, rainforests on fire, Tasmania uh, uh, on, on fire, mass fish kills. Uh, and at two degrees, we see 97% of global coral reefs are dead. So we, you know, two, two degrees is too far. The consensus is that even 1.5 degrees uh, has, has too many risks. How's Australia going, though, on our pledges? Well, emissions, 2005, you'll often hear that used as a reference year. That's because it was a really high emissions year. Uh, but in, from 2015, when we committed to reducing emissions, all we have done is increase them. The below, below line is where we have to go. The top line is where we're going. The middle bit is our carbon debt and it's currently running at 695 million tonnes, uh, and uh, uh, that there's, there's, there's nothing on the horizon uh, that shows that we will currently close that gap. The UN Sustainable Development Goal Index shows that on climate action, Australia is currently running dead last, 156th place out of 156 assessed countries. Where do our emissions come from? Electricity is by far the biggest, but it's only a third of our emissions. We, we talk all the time about the shift to renewables as if that's going to be sufficient, but no, we have to make progress in other sectors. Transport is the next biggest, very closely aligned with stationary energy, which is the energy we use for buildings and heat in industrial uh, processes, basically burning, burning gas and uh, fossil fuels for, for uh, other energy sources. Um, Transport, we all, we all know, it's not just the road network, but also planes and, and, and trains. Agriculture is difficult. Fugitive emissions, uh, but, but there are some things we can do. Fugitive emissions, that's the fastest growing, and that is the gas that's released from coal mining and gas extraction. That is the fastest growing category in Australia, and will probably, uh, if at the current rate, overtake some of these other ones. So we need to address emissions from across the economy, not just in the electricity sector. Over the last three years, uh, since, the, uh, uh, since the Emissions Reduction Fund came into process, in, into, uh, in, into action, our emissions have gone up in the stationary energy sector, the transport sector, and the largest increase in fugitive emissions. This has been offset a little bit by land use and a bit by electricity, but as you can see, all the great work done by everyone who's putting panels on their roof and everyone who's 
working to build this renewable revolution in Australia is currently being wiped out by the fugitive emissions of the LNG industry. Transition. Well, we can do it, um, as, as, as South Australia has, has proven. It's, it's really the, uh, a globally recognised uh, energy system in South Australia. Um, done an amazing thing where this, this black section here is, is coal in their industry, purple is imports. As the wind, green and solar, yellow at the top, have come in over the last 10 years, you can see uh, with, with gas in the middle, the wind and solar have pushed the coal out and are starting to push the gas out and are pushing the imports out where South Australia has become a net energy exporter. But we've got a greater challenge, the rest of the country. As you can see, we're still very, very coal dependent. About 70% of our energy is currently coming from coal, but that's down from 80% a decade ago. In fact, uh, we were, 15 years ago, Australia was 5% renewable. Uh, we're now at 20, and in three years we'll be at 33. So the boom is accelerating. This chart from the Australian Energy Market Operator shows where they think our energy system will go, our electricity system, where it will go under the current policy settings. So that's neutral policy settings, not doing much at all. And we've got coal about 70%, renewables about 20 and that will flip over the next 20 years to be the other way around. 20% coal, 70% renewable. That's if we do nothing. And that has us at 50% renewable in 2030 under the no government policy, neutral setting. This transition's happening. It'll probably accelerate as technology uh, becomes uh, cheaper, and it'll also accelerate as we have government policy to push the transition along. So what would a policy set look like to, to deliver this, uh, this change? We must sustain the renewable energy boom. Uh, it's, it's going fantastically at the moment, but in three years we're looking at a cliff. There's a few things up there we should be doing. We need to start phasing out fossil fuels by electrifying everything, transport and heat uh, in industry and eventually uh, feedstock. Uh, and we must grab the opportunities that, renew that, that this transition presents to us. And I'll leave you with this. Final quote, uh, in a, in a carbon-constrained global economy, Australia is once again the lucky country. We have these boundless plains that are windswept and sun-drenched. Our clean energy resources are the envy of the world. We know we're a lucky country, but are we going to be a clever country? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Our second speaker is Fiona Armstrong, the founder and executive director of the Climate and Health Alliance. She's published extensively on climate and energy policies and their impacts on health and well-being. She has a background in health policy as a health professional and as a journalist. Fiona. Thank you, Peter, and um, thank you for having me. Thanks to the organisers. Um, so, um, my organisation, the Climate and Health Alliance, works to advocate for action on climate change because it is a serious threat to human health. We also work to help the health sector reduce their emissions. The, the emissions in the healthcare sector in Australia are actually at 7%, so more than waste and um, industrial processes on Simon's um, slide. In 2009, the international medical journal The Lancet published a collection of the best available evidence on climate change and health, and they concluded that climate change posed the most serious threat to global public health of the 21st century. Now, some of the ways that climate change impacts on health, climate change is a threat multiplier to existing vulnerabilities. So um, things like environmental degradation can lead to to migration, extreme heat that we're familiar with in Australia um, is uh, the cause of heat illness and death. Um, severe weather uh, um, obviously leading to injuries, fatalities, loss of homes and mental health impacts. Food and water supply impacts can, related to malnutrition. Um, degraded living conditions and social inequities. So people who are already vulnerable and have, have low socioeconomic status are particularly vulnerable. Many of you will have heard about changes in vector ecology, so um, vector-borne diseases such as mosquito-borne um, diseases um, changing their pattern and, and, and the range so that more people are exposed. 
Increasing air pollution and aeroallergens pose risks to health and water quality impacts. And as Simon mentioned, the um, fish kill in the Darling River, the, the same algal blooms and conditions that kill fish also pose serious threats to human health. Um, we're very familiar with heat waves here in Australia, one of the most significant health impacts, and we've just lived through the angry summer. Um, heat waves contribute to increases in hospital admissions for a whole range of different diseases. People with chronic illness, we also see increases in cardiovascular disease and heart attacks, and um, respiratory disease is also impacted um, because air pollution is made worse by hotter temperatures. So, and as the slide says, heat waves already kill more Australians than any other extreme event. Um, floods, we've seen serious floods up in the north of Australia, but in this region you're also familiar with them, um, the impacts on um, damage to homes, but also um, potentially the spread of bacteria and toxins pose a threat to health. Many of you will recall the shocking event in 2016 when we had a thunderstorm asthma event um, related to the increased production of aer aeroallergens during an electrical storm which exploded those into tiny particles that caused very severe um, respiratory impacts, even in people who hadn't experienced asthma in the past, leading to a 3,000% increase in um, admissions to intensive care and the loss of nine lives. Air pollution, as I've mentioned, um, the links between air pollution and climate change is that the same um, um, forces, the, the same activities, burning fossil fuels produces greenhouse gas um, emissions, but it also produces local air pollution. Um, air, the coal is a major villain. Coal-fired power in Australia is responsible for health damages worth $2.6 billion. Vehicle emissions also a cons considerable contributor to air pollution and costing the country $3.3 billion annually. I should point out these um, estimates are old and, um, and they are likely out of date and therefore much higher. Um, this quote here from Nobel Laureate for Medicine, Professor Peter Doherty, is a sobering reflection on the position in which we find ourselves. Without urgent action on climate change, the conditions that underpin the health and well-being of the human population will be greatly diminished in coming decades and may only be available to a small number of people living in a few parts of the planet by the end of this century. We're talking about the lives of people who are alive right now. Um, so what to do about it? Our organisation has developed a framework for a national strategy on climate health and wellbeing for Australia because climate policies alone will not tackle the health impacts of climate change. We need a comprehensive response that not only addresses our need to reduce emissions but tackles the health consequences associated with climate change. Um, the um, framework that we've developed was developed in collaboration with these organisations um, and I'm pleased to say that the Federal Labor Party has committed to implementing a national strategy on climate change and health if elected to govern. The good news is that's little understood in Australia is that climate action is good for health. Um, greenhouse gas mitigation across a, a range of sectors can bring considerable improvements in public health. Um, this slide here captures some of those benefits um, improvements, um, production of more renewable energy, for example, will um, reduce air pollution and cardiovascular and respirat respiratory disease. Improving insulation in our homes will also improve mental health as well as cardiovascular health. And um, encouraging the use of low emissions vehicles um, will lead to less um, incidences of cancer. Public and active forms of transport an opportunity to improve um, obesity, diabetes and mental health. Um, our assessment of the policies in 2016 um, revealed some serious gaps in terms of um, what we saw as the top strategies on climate change and health. Um, now that Labor is committed to stronger emissions reduction targets and a national strategy on climate change and health, that would take them up to four. Um, the Greens would remain at six and a half out of seven, and I'm not aware of any um, advances in policy that would shift the current Liberal, liberal National position. 
So our con my concluding messages are that the health impacts of climate change are happening right now. We need to take action immediately. There are many solutions available. Climate action is good for health. And this election, I urge you to vote for climate change and health. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Our third speaker, I don't think gets a vote at this election, though she may correct me. Uh, Eloisa Moses-McMahon is a Year 11 student. She lives in St Kilda. She regularly volunteers for the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. She helped to organise the recent school strikes for climate. And uh, Eloisa does this all while juggling VCE studies and undertaking the role of environment captain at Albert Park College. Eloisa. Democracy is defined as a system of government that is representative of all citizens. Representative of all citizens. A democratic system should be fair. A democratic system should be equal. A democratic system should reflect the views of society. Ladies and gentlemen, as a 16-year-old living in Australia, I feel extremely angry and disappointed that the politicians within our democracy, the politicians who are meant to reflect and protect our entire society, have failed to answer on the most pressing issue that we face. An issue that not only will affect them and their families, but every single individual in our nation and across our world. Climate change. As a 16-year-old, I know the truth of the situation. I know that there is only 12 years left until climate change becomes irreversible. I know that sea levels are rising at a rate in which we have not seen for centuries. I know that every year that I have been alive, I have experienced a summer hotter than the last. It is this knowledge that has brought me here today. To stand up in front of the politicians that may be soon elected into the House of Representatives and demand change. I stand here on behalf of the 1.6 million students worldwide, the 50,000 students in Melbourne that striked from school on March 15th for their futures. I stand for the other millions of students that were unable to strike, but are some of the most affected by climate change. We need you to be the climate leaders, to listen, and act on our demands of 100% renewables by 2030, no new coal or gas powered stations, and to stop Adani. We need you to be the climate leaders and we need you to listen to our demands. We may be young, but we are powerful and we will keep on fighting until there is climate justice. Thank you.